Our next workshop will be presented by Jen Schilling. And Jen has many different roles. She's a senior research analyst at the University of Arizona. Um, she's a data science mentor at POSIT. And she's a founder of Schilling Data Studio, a data visualization training and consulting agency. And Jen has experience helping analysts grow their data visualization analysis and R skills. Um, and she has experience teaching middle school students, graduate students, and working professionals. So today, Jen will present the workshop Principles of Good Data Viz. So please welcome Jen. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here with you all today. Um, thank you all so much for having me. And let me get my screen sharing up to the right place. And welcome. This will be Principles of Good Data Viz. So I am so glad that you are here today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I am really excited and we're going to get started with some introductions. The overall goal today is to improve and get better at data biz by learning some design principles. So first of all, I'm joining you from Denver, Colorado, and it's important to protect and honor the history and people of the places where we live and work. The land now known as the Denver area is the traditional territory and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute. 48 tribes have called the land now known as Colorado home, and today Colorado is home to two federally recognized tribes, the Southern Ute Indian tribe and the Ute Mountain Ute tribe. This is our agenda for today. So our goal is to be able to explain the key data visualization design principles, apply design principles to create impactful data visualizations, and communicate data effectively through data visualization. We're going to be doing some interactive polling through the session, so keep an eye on the chat um, for that. And um, the outline of our talk for today is first, we're going to talk about what is good data viz. So what are we even talking about before we can talk about principles of good data viz, we've got to kind of figure out what we're talking about. Then we'll talk about the design principles. I'll go through some examples of how you put all this together, and then we'll have some time for discussion and Q&A at the end. Um, the main part of the presentation will be focused a lot on the design principles section. All right, so um, first of all, who am I? I'm Jen Schilling, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I've been working with data for over a decade and I really love data visualization. I really enjoy creating charts and graphs to communicate data. Um, as Julia already mentioned, I'm the founder of Schilling Data Studio, a data visualization training and consulting company. I'm also an analyst with the University of Arizona and I've been, um, I've been, had many different other roles, but I've been an adjunct faculty member at the College for Creative Studies, where I've also taught um, graduate classes on data visualization. I really love data viz and design, and I'm super excited to get to be here and share my knowledge with you in this session. Um, I've also worked as a middle school teacher, an operations research engineer in the supply chain, and a statistician in market research. So I guess I just like doing lots of different things. Um, and over the years, I've learned some key design principles that support me in creating impactful visualizations. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. Um, and so I'm just really glad to be here and I hope that you find this super helpful. So in order to get started, we have to talk about what is good data viz? What does good data viz look like? Um, so think back to some of the data visualizations you've seen or maybe ones you've made and what do you think makes them good? And here is where we're going to do our first poll that I think the link um, just got or um, I think Valerie's going to put the link for us in the chat. Um, so if you can click on the link in the chat when we get it in there and then oh thank you so much Valerie and I will switch my screen sharing. And so let's just brainstorm some ideas for what is good data viz. So what do you think of when you think of good data viz? All right, great. Understand at a glance. Thank you. Easy to read, aesthetics, awesome. Easy to read, clear, concise, easy to interpret, relevant, clearly shows what's going on, tells a story, quickly, accurately understood. Awesome, these are great, thank you. Highlights the message, yes to the point and simple. If colors, they have meaning, not random. Yes, it's a good one. All right, so a lot of things that are coming through here are it's clear, it's easy to understand, um, it's sometimes simple. I will say, and I do, I, a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today in terms of the design principles are on kind of making things simpler, easier to understand. Um, and I like this attractive and understandable piece, especially understandable for non-technical people. So a lot of that is going to be that 
kind of focused on that area. I think there are times when more complicated visualizations can be really good. Um, and sometimes a more complex visualization can draw people in and um, the, the time that they spend trying to read it and figure it out can be really great at engaging them. Um, but generally what we're gonna be focused on today are these more like, how do we make it a little simpler? How do we make it easier to understand? How do we make it so it's really quick to get the key message? Um, and so a lot of this ties in really well to what we're gonna be talking about today. So this is awesome, thank you. I think my next slide is another question. So we're gonna go, um, to that. And I think if I go to the next question here, the link should, it should be the same link and it should um, then, um, actually, I think, I'm not sure which, which one of the, so, uh, well, I think it's the first link still, but um, one of the links should take you now to a question that says, why does good data this matter? Um, which will be another one uh, open-ended for us to talk about. So why why does this matter? We've talked good data viz, we've kind of broadly defined as something that makes it easier to read. It might be, it has nice aesthetics. It looks nice. It highlights information. Um, so why, why does it matter? I like this person that says, otherwise, why bother? Yeah, that's true. I mean, if we don't have um, good design of our data viz, then that might mean that someone might not read it. Um, so results don't get mis misinterpreted. That's a really good one as well. Um, and clear understanding, someone has also said, and I think that's a really important thing. If we don't think about the design of our data viz, um, then we could lead to someone misinterpreting the, um, the findings or the data. Again, we've got some ideas around saving time, understanding the data quickly, educates and motivates the audience. That's a good point too, because through the thinking about the design of our data viz, that's how we can draw our audience in and motivate them to read it and then educate them through that. Making it more clear to communicate. Um, it can add business value and the right outcomes, help the public understand it. Yeah, especially if we're working, someone mentioned non-technical users in the previous question and here the public too, especially if we're creating data visualizations for people who aren't used to looking at graphs, um, or maybe just aren't familiar with the data that we're presenting, it's really important to think about these design principles to make it easier for them to understand, um, to make it easier for the visuals for people to understand. And that's kind of, as someone said, like, why, otherwise, why bother? Because that is kind of the whole point, right? Because we're, I at least am creating data visualizations because I want to communicate information. And the, it, through this idea of like good data viz, um, that's going to make it easier for people to understand that data and make it easier for me to communicate my message. So we've also got supporting visual learners. That's also really important. Um, again, what's the point uh, of data if people don't understand what they show? Communication more accessible, um, actionable insights, and help make decisions correctly without misguiding. Yeah, definitely. So thank you all so much. I like all of these ideas. I think that's that's exactly why these things matter. So I'm going to switch back to my slides. We'll come back to some um, other polls in a little bit. Um, so these aren't simple questions with straightforward answers. Particularly, why does it matter? Um, Broadly speaking, uh, kind of to summarize some of the things that have already been said, I think it's important to be honest and truthful and accurately represent the data while keeping in your audience, in mind your audience, your goal to inform your audience. And then these principles we're going to talk about, about how humans perceive visual elements. So we're also, before we jump into those principles, we're gonna look at some thoughts from a few experts in the field of data viz um, about what effective data viz is and why it matters. So in Tukey's book, Exploratory Data Analysis, um, who John Tukey was a mathematician and a statistician, he said, the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. So here's a thing that is important about visualization and maybe an idea of some sort of definition of an effective data viz is it forces us to notice something we didn't expect. Um, I'm, if you're familiar with data viz, you've probably heard of Edward Tufte, who's written several books on data visualization and is well known as a data viz expert, although sometimes he can be controversial in his very strong opinions about things like pie charts. Um, I try not to have too strong opinions about data viz because I think there's a lot of nuance in it. Um, but I do like this quote of his from one of his books that says, graphical excellence is the well-designed presentation of interesting data, a matter of substance of statistics and of design. 
It consists of complex ideas communicated with clarity, precision, and efficiency. It is that which gives to the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. It's nearly always multivariate, meaning it usually uses multiple variables, and graphical excellence requires telling the truth about the data. So there's a lot in this quotation, but I particularly like this idea of like interesting data communicating clearly with and with precision, um, being truthful. And then a key thing about uh, Tufti, if you know any of his work, is he's very big on this idea of data, the data to ink ratio, which is this concept of um, not having too much clutter in a chart and not having a lot of um, you know, not having any extra elements, which I mean, I think that's where I think nuance comes in. But um, I really, I really like his emphasis here on like the truthfulness and the clarity precision piece. Um, Donna Wong has a book called The Wall Street Journal Guide to Information Graphics, and it's a really great little guide to um, data viz principles and um, yeah, I guess journal, it's a guide. So I am um, this is a quote from that book that says, ultimately, it is the content that makes graphics interesting. When a chart is presented properly, information just flows to the viewer in the clearest and most efficient way. There are no extra layers of color, no enhancements to distract us from the clarity of the information. And this reminds me of something, um, one of someone's responses to one of the questions earlier, which was about color. If you're going to use color, make sure there's meaning to it, not just random. Um, so I think that that ties in here a little bit, but also this idea that it's flowing to the, the viewer, right? The viewer um, just kind of, they don't have to do too much work to receive the information presented in the visualization. Um, Alberto Cairo has um, a couple books out about data visualization and is a uh, professor and researcher in the field. Um, he says that a good visualization is reliable information, visually encoded, so relevant patterns become noticeable, organized in a way that enables at least some exploration when it's appropriate, and presented in an attractive manner, but always remembering that honesty, clarity, and depth come first. And so this piece and folk, or this part and focus on this idea of reliable information and, and doing honesty, clarity, and depth first, um, I think is really important because it is fun to play around with the design of a visualization. And as we're going to talk about, there's a lot of different ways to use design um, to enhance a visualization. But if the underlying information is not reliable, if you're not presenting it truthfully and accurately, then the rest of it doesn't matter. It really is matters making sure that you start with information that's accurate and reliable. And then we have uh, these two quotes. The first one is from Healy and the second one is from Wexler is that, um, and I put these in here because they're really thinking about the audience, right? The effectiveness of any particular graph is not just a matter of how it looks in the abstract, but also a question of who is looking at it and why. And I think it's really important to always keep in mind our audience when we're creating a visualization. We need to think about who they are, why they're looking at it, what background they have in the data, what background they have in this specific topic, as well as what background they have in data with data in general, or with looking at graphs in general. Are they really familiar and comfortable with working with data? Are they really familiar and comfortable with the topic of the graph, or are they not? And that's going to change how we present the information. And then um, Wexler's quote is, a good visualization can do more than just answer questions. It can help you see that there are other questions you need to answer. So I really like this idea of visualization as a way to explore data and visualization as a way to help other people explore data too, right? We can create graphs for ourselves as we're going through a data analysis process to get some exploration. And in some cases, the audience of the graphs if our, is just ourselves. And that may have changed how much we effort we put into the designer how um, you know how much we go through some of the editing processes or just making some quick visuals depending on the audience. But visualizations can help us see things, but they can also help our audience see things if our audience is external to us and help them see if there are more questions they need to answer. And the final quote here, I wanted to make sure I put in because I'm going to talk a lot about principles. And this quote is from Data Feminism, which is a really great book about working with data and doing data science. Um, I'd really recommend it. Um, and there's a chapter in there that does focus some on visualization. 
And it says, this quote comes from that chapter. It says, rather than making universal rules and ratios that exclude some aspects of human experience in favor of others, our time is better spent working toward a more holistic and more inclusive ideal. All design fields, including visualization and data communication are fields of possibility. Rebalancing emotion and reason opens up the data communication toolbox and allows us to focus on what truly matters in the design process, honoring context, architect architecting attention, and taking action to defy stereotypes and reimagine the world. And so I'm going to be talking a lot about principles in the ne this next part, um, but I, and I think they're all really good and grounded in research and definitely very useful principles. Um, but there's also this piece of that there's a, there is nuance to it. Um, you don't always have to follow these. They're not like strict rules you always have to follow. And it's important to always put our data in the context and consider our audiences and the people who, where our data came from and who we're showing it to as we're building out visualizations. So returning to these two questions again, what is good data viz and why does good data viz matter? Good data, whoops, I'm sorry there. Let me go back a little bit. Um, good data viz presents a or accurate information in context. It considers the audience and presents information in an attractive way while being clear and efficient. It involves creating a meaningful design that enables understanding of the data. Each element of the de design should serve a purpose and distraction should be removed. Our overall goal is greater clarity and simplification when it's um, useful when simplification is useful. Um, when our audience sees an overly complicated design, they'll automatically assume that it's going to be challenging to understand, and then they're usually less likely to engage with it. On the other hand, when they see a clean, simple, beautiful design, they assume it will be easy to understand, and then they're more likely to engage with it. So when we create data visualizations that make our audiences feel like they're easy to read, they're going to more quickly understand the key message, and they're also more likely to take the desired action that we recommend. And when we're intentional with our design choices, the audience notices a difference, and they're more likely to engage with something they perceive as well-designed. And so whether it's the font choices, your colors that you use, the types of charts, the titles, the grid lines, the alignment, those are all design choices that have an impact on how our audience experiences the data visualization and whether or not they understand the key message. So this matters because it makes our audience engage with the data and it helps us more effectively communicate the information. So next we're gonna talk about how do we create this thing called good data viz. And the one other ways that we do that is by using the design principles we're going to talk about. So three key areas of design that we're going to talk about today are the pre-attentive attributes, which are visual encodings that our brains process without our conscious awareness, and they help focus the audience's attention. Then we're going to talk about the Gestalt principles of visual perception, which were established by the Gestalt School of Psychology in the early 1900s, based on research of how people interact with and create order from visual stimuli. These principles help us reduce clutter and reduce the cognitive load for the audience. And they also help us understand how the audience will interpret and make meaning from the visualization. Then we're going to discuss some basic color principles. When we use color consistently and according to best practices, it makes it easier for the audience to understand and interpret a visualization. And by understanding these three topics all together, we can create effective data visualizations that are easy for the audience to understand and engage with. And the goal of using these concepts is to reduce the cognitive load of the data viz, which means that the viewer won't have to work so hard to understand it. So before we move on to talking about the principles, I briefly want to answer this question of why am I talking about design in relation to data viz? And we probably don't think about it very much, but every time you create a chart and a graph, you're making several design decisions. First, you have to decide what data to show. You have to decide what type of chart to use. You have to decide whether or not to use color and what colors to use. You have to decide how to label the axes and what to write in the title. And oftentimes we can let the software that we're using make some of these decisions for us by using default settings. So we might not even realize we're making so many decisions. Or maybe you do realize it and it's just exhausting to have to figure so many things out. So that's where design comes in. Knowing these design principles in relation to data viz makes creating charts and graphs easier. You have these guidelines to fall back on and they're proven to help draw attention to the main point you're trying to make with your data. 
The design principles we're going to talk about are based on how human brains process and organize information. So by taking advantage of these automatic and rapid processing steps in the brain, we can create data visualizations that immediately provide key information and takeaways. And these principles apply in any tool that you use to create data visualizations. You don't have to be able to code or use a specific software to make use of the principles. Design can be used to make good data viz, regardless of whether you use Excel, Google Stage Studio, R, Python, Tableau, Adobe, or something else to create your graphs and charts. So let's um, start getting into these principles. First, I have one other quick um, poll, and this one is just a multiple choice answer about what your experience is with the pre-attentive attributes or gestalt principles. And I see we've got a few answers already. And this will be that um, second link in the chat. And maybe Valerie can share again. Thanks, Valerie. All right, so you, I think I'm sharing the poll, the results screen. Yep, okay. And I see results coming in, thank you. So some people have heard of these before, but most people, these are new and that's great. I'm gonna be walking through all of them. And if you heard of them before, hopefully um, I'll share something a little bit new or maybe it'll just be a good reminder about them. All right, I don't see the numbers changing very much at the moment, but so I'll switch back over to my slides. Okay, so now I have something for you can put an answer in the chat. I'm going to show you a set of numbers and I'd like you to tell me um, how many times you see the number two. So take a look at this slide and tell me how many times you see the number two. And you can just post this in the chat when you're ready. All right, six. I got to see a lot of sixes and fives coming through. Oh, I see a seven. Awesome. Okay. So five, six, seven, uh, mostly fives and sixes. All right. And a few sevens. Okay. So awesome. Thank you all. I'm going to show the same slide, but with something slightly different. So now I have highlighted the twos um, in a different color. And if you count the two in the question, then I think there are seven. Um, <laughs> I had to do a quick count myself. Um, but if I were to have shown you this slide quick first, how much easier would it have been and faster would it have been for you to identify the twos in this version? Color actually helps our brains identify the twos immediately without us having to process all of the numbers or consciously look for them. Um, there's other things that I could have done. I could have bolded them or made them larger or circled them. But what I did here is I used color to draw your attention to it immediately. And that's actually a pre-attentive attribute. So pre-attentive attributes can be used to draw attention to key pieces of information. Adding color to the twos here makes it really clear what you should pay attention to in this visualization, in, in quotes. Um, I guess this could count as a visualization, but it's not actually showing any real data except for random numbers. But you don't have to process all of the information to figure it out. You just need to look at the twos because I've highlighted them to say, hey, pay attention to the twos. So we can use this when creating data visualizations by emphasizing the most important information for the viewer so they don't have to process the whole visual all at once. They can have their attention draw to the most important part. And then they can, after they've noticed that, then they'll notice the rest of the visualization. Oops, I am pressing the down arrow in the wrong. Uh, area. Okay, so here's a uh, slide that just shows all the pre-attentive attributes. We're going to go into each one of them in detail. So pre-attentive attributes can be used to help people understand data, focus the viewer's attention, and create a visual hierarchy. Um, someone put in the chat, only if we can trust you highlighted all of them. Yes, that is true. Um, but I think that's where this idea of like, a part of the effectiveness of visualization is this idea that we, as the person creating it, is are, are, are going to create it in a way that is trustworthy and accurate. But yes, um, that that does that it will draw your attention to the twos, and then you might have to look more carefully to make sure that I actually highlighted them all. <laughs> so these pre-attentive attributes can be used to put emphasis on the most important pieces of data by providing visual cues that are automatically going to draw the viewer's attention. They help us um, enable our audience to see what we want them to see before they even know that they're seeing it. So 11 of 
The pre-attended attributes are shown here. There's length, width, size, shape, orientation, curvature, added marks, enclosure, intensity, hue, and position. And in each of these little mini examples, you'll immediately see the element that's different, whether it's longer, a different shape, oriented differently, has an extra mark, or is a different color. Your eye is just drawn to it, and you don't have to search for the thing that is highlighted. This is because our brains are hardwired to quickly pick up the differences we see in our environment. And we're not going to discuss it, but you can use these pre-attentive attributes also in text. So examples are bolding and italicizing certain words, using a different color for a different word, um, or sentence, changing the font size, doing line spacing, outlining and or outlining an area of text and underlining. So these do apply in text as well. I'm going to be focused on how they apply in visualization, but just to let you know, that's another reason why a bold word stands out. So in a moment, we're going to talk through examples of each of the pre-attentive attributes. But first, I just wanted to briefly talk about the data I'll be using for almost all of the examples we're going to look at today. Um, the data comes from an R package called Palmer Penguins. Um, R is a programming language, and you may have heard of it before, but it's not super important for this session um, because I'm just going to be showing you visualizations and not code. Um, but the data from the Palmer Penguins package is a set of penguin observations. They were collected and made available by Dr. Kristen Gordman and the Palmer Station Antarctica LTR, which is a member of the Long-Term Ecological Research Network. So the main thing that you need to know about the data is that there's penguins, uh, there, there are observations about penguins. There's three species of penguins, um, a daily chinstrap and gentoo. The data contains information about the penguins, like information about what island they were observed on, their bill length, their bill depth, their flipper length, their sex, things like that. And using the data, I'll have, I've will have created the examples we're going to see of applications of the pre-attentive attributes and later on of the gestalt principles. So the first pre-attentive attribute we're going to talk about is length. And the pre-attentive attribute of length means that an object of a different length stands out. This generally can be seen in column charts and bar charts. And this example of a very simple bar chart that's just showing the counts of the number of penguins in that data set by species, um, you may first notice the longest bar. Uh, also, it's, orient it's positioned, so it's on the top, so that might draw your attention. Or you may well notice the shortest bar, the chin strap bar, um, because it, it, it is shorter and quite a bit shorter than the other two bars. But the important thing to know about this is that the if you're making bar graphs especially, but any other time you're using length in a graph, the object or the bar that is the most different is the one that's going to stand out to your audience. And maybe this is where you want them to focus, um, but maybe it is not where you want them to focus. So, it's the reason that these are useful is that they can be used to draw your attention, your audience's attention exactly to what you want them to know to the key information. But they're also important to keep in mind because they could distract your audience if, say, I wanted to focus on the fact that the chin strap penguins were the least frequent and my audience might jump to the longest bar. So these are, that's why these are really useful to know about because they are how we interpret data. Um, and so we can make use of them certainly, but we also can know about them because it could distract our audience depending on our message. And I'll talk some more. Some of the other principles could be used to, if we wanted to draw attention to, say, the chin strap bar instead of the daily bar. Some of the things that we're going to talk about later could help with that. So the next one is width. And again, basically all of these is the object that's the most different stands out. So an object of a different width stands out. This generally shows up in tree maps and 100% stacked column charts. This is an example of a 100% stacked bar or column chart. And in this case, for me, I see the, my focus is drawn to the teal bars, which are the adate, or teal section of the bars, and to the last bar, which is all teal, um, where the other two are only partially teal, because the uh, Bisco and Dream Islands have um, both, or two species of penguins on them, and the Torgerson Island at the bottom has only one species of penguin on them. So, Again, your attention may have been drawn to a slightly different part. That's where my attention goes. But we're going to pay attention to the object that has a different width, and that's where our attention is going to be drawn. The si an object that's a different size also stands out. So this usually shows up in things like scatter plots with size added in or a bubble chart. In this case, I'm showing bill depth versus bill length. And then I put the body mass of the penguins as the size of the point. And 
there's a lot of points on here. My attention first is drawn to the top left where there's kind of a cluster of points. And I think there, they're also slightly larger points. So that's where my attention is going with size. Um, I then also kind of get my attention drawn to the bottom of the chart um, where there's some smaller points in kind of the bottom middle part. So again, it's just paying attention to where our, our attention goes as the person creating the chart and then knowing that our audience is going to be paying attention to what looks most different. When an object's a different shape, it also stands out. Again, this shows up a lot in scatter plots. And then when we encode different types of points uh, with different shapes. So in this case, it's the same chart we were just looking at, but this time I have changed the points to be different shapes based on the species. Um, you can also use this in a scatter plot if you want to highlight a specific point. Like let's say we had all circles and then we wanted our audience to focus on one specific point. We can make that point a triangle. Color works a little bit better than shape for something like that, but that's somewhere where shape shows up. When we have an object of a different orientation, it stands out. So this is usually shown in line charts um, or if you're looking across columns or bars, um, or between column, like two different bar and column charts. Um, in this case, I'm showing a slope graph and my attention is drawn to the Gen 2 bar, which has the steepest slope. Your attention could also be drawn to the chin strap bar at the bottom because that's the only one that has a slightly negative um, slope going down. This is showing the number of penguins between two different years. Curvature is um, quite similar to orientation in that it's, a, it's, it's related to line charts, but here is that when an object has a different curvature, it stands out. So usually this shows up in a line graph if the, you know, if there's a sudden spike or if there, if the, if a line chart's kind of going up and then it starts going down. So that would be um, kind of a change in curvature. So here it could be that um, you notice the Gen 2 bar again in the middle because we have that little spike in 2008, or maybe the chin strap bar at the bottom because that one has a dip in 2008. Um, again, it, it can depend on the person what specifically you notice first, but it gets the, it's where there's the difference. That's where it stands out. Added marks are very similar to what we were looking at with shape. Um, when we add, add something like a line, or in this case, it's the sc same scatter plot, but with X's and then stars um, to kind of try and add marks to the, the X. Um, so an object with an added mark stands out. And here, your attention will be drawn to the left side of the chart because that's where the stars are and they're different from the X's in the rest of the chart. Enclosure can be really useful. Um, and it's also a gestalt principle. Um, in this case, for the pre-attentive attribute, an object with a border, um, it, it stands out. So an object with a border or a shaded area stands out. Um, it's a very kind of faint border on here, but I have added a border around the chin strap bar to draw attention to that. And enclosure could also be used to frame or shade a section of a table or graph to draw attention to it and help the viewer group the enclosed elements together, which is what we're going to show um, in the Gestalt Principles piece, which we'll talk about soon. All right, so intensity means that an object with a different intensity or saturation stands out. This usually shows up in heat maps and shaded tables. In this example, um, this is showing just the counts of the number of penguins in each year. And I have highlight, I've shaded the areas or the parts of the table based on the number of penguins. My attention actually goes to the middle of this chart, the 18, because that's the lightest color. And maybe that would be where I wanted to focus my audience's attention and highlight that there's fewer chin strap penguins than the other. And there was this dip in 2018. But if, I, or sorry, excuse me, 2008 to 18. Um, but if I wanted more to focus on the Adelie penguins and how many more of them there are than the other penguins, I might adjust my shading or maybe choose a different chart um, than a heat map because the most different one here to me is that lightest color. And so that's where my attention and my audience's attention is going to be drawn. Um, now, this is a very slightly, this is a different data set, um, but this is taken from the Data Visualization Society survey, of, and it's a question about um, what are frustrations for data viz professionals. And in this case, I'm using 
uh, orange or hue to highlight the information that I want people to focus on. So I want people to focus on the lack of time and lack of design expertise or top frustrations. I've shown all of the frustrations, but those are the two uh, responses that I want to focus on. And in the chat, uh, Julia said that in all three uh, color ones, so I think that was the line graphs we were talking about a few moments ago, um, their eye is drawn to always to the orange because the color is so much brighter. So yeah, so that's where this hue comes in. Um, your color choices, even here, I'm just using one color or two colors, I guess, gray and orange, but your color choices when using multiple colors can also affect what people's eyes are drawn to because the one that's brighter um, will attract attention. So thanks for bringing that up. And then finally, we have position. So an object in a different position stands out. This is how we are really good at notice, noticing outliers. Um, whether or not they are true outliers, we do um, immediately notice points that are out of alignment or out of a grouping with other points. And so this usually shows up in something like a scatter plot. Um, in this case, this is just that same scatter plot we've been looking at, build depth versus build length, but just with only points. And my attention goes first to the very top of the, the top middle, because that's where I see like three points kind of standing out from the rest. Um, again, your attention might go somewhere else, but the position, the object that all we perceive as being most in the most different position is the one that's going to stand out to us. And again, all of these are, can be really useful. Like they can be used to draw, draw our audience's attention to what we want them to see, but they could also result in distraction because our audience might notice those outliers, but we actually want them to focus on this other thing over here at part of the chart. Um, so that's why these are really useful useful to know about because not only can we use them to draw attention to what we want, we can also use them to try and um, you know, help other things fade into the background. So for example, in this chart, if I thought my audience's attention was immediately going to be drawn to those three points at the top and I didn't want them to focus there, well, maybe I could make the area that I wanted them to focus, I could make all those points green and make the rest of the points light gray or something like that. Then my audience would focus on the green points first. Um, or maybe I could pick a different chart type um, and that would help to focus my audience's attention on like the message that I want them to get. So the next thing we're going to do is take a look at a comparison between some different pre-attentive attributes with numeric data. And we're going to look at how color, length, and position makes different parts of these graphs stand out. Again, we're looking at these Palmer penguins, um, that data set, and I we're just going to look at the Gen 2 penguins to see if we can tell how much different 2008 was, was from 2007 and 2009, and also pay attention to what we notice first. So first we're going to use color here. So I've just encoded three rectangles with different colors based on the number of penguins of the Gen 2 species in each of those years. So comparing numeric values using only color is difficult to do accurately if we're trying to, especially if we're trying to quantify the difference. So I can tell that 2008 is darker and therefore more, but I can't really quantify how much darker it is in terms of a number uh, between 2007 and 2009. Um, and then we can think about where our eyes went first in the graph. So for me, I, in this one, I actually do notice 2008 first because it's the darkest. And in terms of the question of how much larger was 2008, that works because I went to 2008 first. Can't, I can't estimate the difference so well, but I did notice that one first. So then using length, we can more precisely and easily estimate how much different 2008 was from 2007 and 2009, especially if I had given you a scale on this graph, you could probably do that quite easily. In this representation though, I actually noticed 2007 first because it's shorter than the other two bars. So in this instance, 2007 is standing out to me first, um, but then I can gonna read across the graph and see, okay, 2008, 2009, and I'd be able to more accurately um, interpret and understand the, the values if I'd given you labels on here. And then this one's using position here um, with the bar graph, I started the scale of zero, uh, but with this uh, position version where I've connected the points with a line, um, I just use the default scale that um, R came up with, which didn't start at zero because I didn't start with zero penguins. Um, so here, um, if I given a scale, again, it'd be more easy to accurately compare the difference. And in this example, I am noticing 2008 first because it has the highest position, and then also because of orientation and curvature, because there's a very steep line connecting 2007 to 2008. So to generalize this, think about what you want your audience to pay attention to, and then you can use the pre-attentive attributes to draw attention to that part of the graph. 
And it's also important to think about what you want your audience to do and to make graph choices to support that. And as humans, we're really good at comparing the length of bars and position of dots. Um, and so that's why it's easier to make accurate comparisons, especially if I've given you numbers on the last two examples um, in this slide. And we're not very good at accurately comparing values of things um, like color or um, size. I mean, we can tell that 2008 is darker and therefore we associate darker with more, but we can't tell how much darker it is. So that's just some of the things to think about as you're picking out what type of chart you wanna use for what type of situation. Um, we're not really gonna get into chart types today. There's certainly a lot to share about there, um, but thinking about what you want your audience to do is one of the ways that you can pick what kind of chart you want. All right, so now we're going to talk about Gestalt principles. And as I mentioned earlier, the Gestalt uh, principles of visual perception were established by the Gestalt School of Psychology in the early 1900s. And they were based on research of how people interact with and create order from visual stimuli. And the psychologists involved in the research theorized that we tend to group elements, look for patterns, and reduce complex images to their simplest forms. So we can use these in data viz because it's going to help our viewer more easily understand our visualizations when we implement these principles. We can then reduce the cognitive load or the amount of processing the viewer has to take on to understand the data because the principles are based on how people naturally interpret and process visual elements. One thing um, to note about just all principles and how we view data in general is that we're always looking for structure and relationships. So it's important to keep this in mind as we design data visualizations because our viewers will always look for structure and relationships whether or not they're actually there. Um, of course, there's interpretation involved when viewing a visualization that extends beyond those immediate perceptions, but it's important to understand that the pre-attentive attributes and the gestalt principles um, influence a person's initial engagement with a visualization. And so we can use them to highlight information, draw attention, create hierarchies, um, and reduce the cognitive load of processing of visualization. So they're very useful as we're designing them, but they're also important to keep in mind because it's they're based on how people just kind of accurate, um, actually interpret information. So the six principles we're gonna talk about are proximity, similarity, enclosure, closure, continuity, and connection. And we'll go through each of them in turn as well. And I saw that there a question came in in the chat, and I think I'm going to save that one for the end, but it's a really good question. So thanks for asking that. All right, so we're going to start with proximity. And again, these are these just all principles are all about how we group things together. So for proximity, elements that are close together are thought of as belonging to a group. We can use this when we create a table by adding more space between rows um, to help the viewer easily associate a row of data. Um, it also applies in scatter plots because we're naturally going to find groupings of data that are close together. And the groupings may be meaningful or they may not, but either way, our group, our brain is going to interpret them as groups. So this is the same scatter plot we looked at earlier, which shows the bill depth versus the bill length for those penguins. And we can see groupings based on which points are close to each other. In this case, the proximity groupings are actually distinct as we're going to see, well, we've already kind of seen, but we're definitely gonna see in a second, but we're naturally gonna associate groupings based on the proximity of the points to each other. And in some cases, those groupings might not be meaningful. So for me, I kind of see a group of points to the left and then kind of in the bottom right and maybe kind of in the middle somewhere as well. And when we add color, we can see that those are meaningful groupings um, because they're all different species in those groups. So color uses the gestalt principle of similarity. Elements that look similar are thought of as belonging to a group. So things that are similar color, shape, or size, we group them together. Frequently we see this in scatter plots, um, but also it applies in things like bar graphs. If we're using color for each bar and a legend or different categories, um, that principle of similarity helps our audience connect Oh, these green bars, those all are associated with X category. Enclosure we saw as a pre-attentive attribute as a way to draw attention, but it also is a gestalt principle because elements that are physically enclosed together are thought of as belonging to a group. So in this case, I have drawn a box around part of the points in the scatter plot, and we will associate everything within that box as a group and everything outside of that box as another group. One way this is really useful. Um, and visualization is if you are showing actual data and forecasted data, say you have a line graph of an actual and then um, part of the line graph extends into a forecast, if you shade 
the area of the forecast, like kind of the background area, one that will draw people's attention to the forecast, and two, it will help your audience associate, okay, everything in this shaded area is a group forecast, everything outside of the shaded area is a group actual values. So that's another way that enclosure can come in um, in, in visualization. Closure um, is really interesting, and this is how a lot of logos actually work, um, but closure means that the brain fills in gaps to create a recognizable image. So we perceive the, the whole before the parts. In visualizations, we can use this to remove borders and backgrounds because the brain is going to perceive the whole chart together without those additional elements. And sometimes removing those extra elements helps the data stand out more. So in all the previous examples, I've shown plots with a light blue background, but that's not necessary for us to know that all the elements of the plot go together. So in this example, I've removed that background, but we still associate the title, all the bars together, the data labels together, like we still associate that all as one graph. For continuity, elements that are ordered in a line or curve are thought of as belonging to a group, and we look for the smoothest path and naturally create continuous lines. So we can use this to remove axis lines in a bar graph, like this previous example. I don't have a y-axis line, but we still associate all of those bars as lining up together. Um, but it does also apply in scatter plots because we're going to try and follow a continuous path between the points, again, whether or not that's meaningful. So in this example, I have the, a point for the number of penguins of each species in each year, and I haven't connected them together. So color might help us here because we would connect kind of all the points of the same color together. But if I didn't have color, I think I would probably connect the points in lines for each year together. So this is just an interesting thing to think about, and especially if you're showing points in a in a line in a scatter plot, or even if the line isn't really meaningful, but if it looks like all the points line up, our brains are going to try and associate that into a continuous line. When I take that previous plot and connect the points together, that, that uses the Gestalt principle of connection, which is a very strong um, association. When we physically connect things, they're thought of as belonging to a group. Generally, this shows up in line graphs. Um, I guess it could probably shows up in a few different, like if you do a kind of continuous line graph with an XY scatter plot, there's a few other ways that you can do this. But anytime you're connecting things um, in a graph, then that's going to associate them together in a group. Um, I think this also plays into if we're doing annotations in the plot, if we're kind of adding reference lines and things, that's how we tie the annotation or the text to the line to the data point that we're labeling. So those are the six. Um, gestalt principles, and now we're going to talk about color. So color has three components, hue, saturation, and value. Hue is the shade, or what we typically think of when we say color. Saturation is the intensity, or how rich and intense the color is, and value is the lightness or darkness. And these three components are how we create different colors. And we've already seen how color can be used to draw attention, highlight information, group data points together. Now we're going to talk more specifically about the main uses of color in data visualization. So when used on a data viz or a dashboard, as we've already mentioned, um, so thanks for the person who um, put in that response early on when we did the open-ended questions, color should have a clear purpose. We also want to make sure it is consistent and accessible. And if one color is used to indicate a specific category, we want to use it um, every time that category is included. If one color is used to highlight an important data point, we want to use it consistently across all the visualizations to highlight information. Because consistency helps the viewer make, make meaning from color, and it makes it easier for them to understand the important information. We want to use color with a purpose and not arbitrarily add it. Using too many colors defeats the purpose of associating numbers with colors. And research shows that most people's short-term memory will only retain up to five pieces of information at one time. So the more colors you use to represent the data, the harder it becomes to read it. And if you need more than five colors, you might consider using a different chart. So the main ways that we use color in data visualization are highlighting, which we've already talked about, um, bringing someone's attention to a data point, 
Uh, you can also use it to just designate different categories or labels, which can help the user differentiate between different groups. You can then also apply color to quantitative or numeric values, either in a sequential or a diverging scale. So sequential color is used to show values from low to high on a continuous scale, and divergent color is, is used to show values above or below a midpoint or some sort of um, medium value or average value or maybe above and below zero um, on a continuous scale. We want to remember that we should only add color when it add, adds meaning and helps with understanding. So I'm going to go through a few examples now of um, how charts that are using color could be improved um, to kind of use color more sparingly and consistently. So using color consistently and sparingly helps color keep its meaning and also maintains its use as a pre-attentive attribute. If you use many colors in one visualization, it makes it harder for the audience to interpret rather than easier because they have to work hard to figure out what all the different colors mean. And we want to choose colors strategically to add information and context. And sometimes color is not even needed in a visualization if it's not going to add meaning. So in this example, I have, again, my number total number of penguins in that data set by species. And I have, in the left-hand example, I have each bar a different color. But adding color to this visualization actually makes our audience work harder because they have to figure out what each color means. And if this was the only visualization I was presenting, then I could probably present it as the graph on the right, which still labels each species, has one bar per species, but I've taken the color off, and so all the bars are the same color. If I wanted to add color back in, I could use color to highlight one particular species if I wanted the audience to focus there. So for example, if the main takeaway of the graph was that there are more daily penguins, then I could just highlight that bar and make the rest of them gray to kind of focus the audience's attention there. Um, in this example, I this is made up data and I purposely made it very messy. Um, but here I'm showing number of students over time for four different groups as a line graph, and each line is shown in a different color. And it's very challenging to follow these lines. As I said, this was kind of a, a, an example I purposely made um, with the lines overlapping a lot. But in addition to the lines with a lot of overlap, the audience has to look back and forth between the lines in the legend to figure out what each line represents. So there are a few options here. One for a way to use it with different way with color is if I only wanted to focus on one of the groups, I could highlight group four in teal and then make the rest of the lines gray. And then the audience no longer has to look back and forth between the legend. Um, it does mean that all three other groups are look kind of all, look all the same. They're not able to be distinguished. So I could make them three different gray colors to kind of differentiate them. Or if I was really presenting and trying to show all four groups separately, I'd probably turn this into four different um, bar graph, or excuse me, line graphs. Um, so I'd have a set of like four small line graphs, one for each group, if that's what I wanted my audience to do. But again, see, I'm thinking about what do I want my audience to do? In this example, maybe, I, maybe my audience is group four, and I just want them to be able to see their information. And the other information is just there for reference to say, hey, there are three other groups we're comparing to, and we can see how all of us have had an increase in the last year, and we're the second highest or something like that. Um, so that's where coming, thinking about what your audience wants and what they need from the data really is important. Another thing to think about when using color is maintaining consistency. And so by that, I mean using the same color to highlight key information and the same color for a specific category across visualizations, because this helps the, under, the audience understand the visualizations more easily. So here I'm using, uh, I have a line graph and a scatter plot, both showing information for the three penguin species, and I'm using the same color for the same species in each plot. And once my audience understands that orange is associated with chin strap, they'll be able to compare chin strap information across all my visualizations because I'm always using orange for chin strap. Another thing about um, using color consistently is that you can use it to signal a change to the audience. So if a new topic is introduced in a report or the tone changes in a presentation, you can start using a different color to highlight the information in that new section because that cues your audience that something has changed. So for one section of a report, I'm always using teal to highlight, and now I'm in a new section, I could switch to using orange to highlight all the time. Next, we're gonna talk about some color meanings, and then we'll do a couple examples. We'll see how much time, maybe we'll do one example. If we've got time, I'll do both examples to kind of how you tie this all together, and then I'll make sure we've got time at the end for questions. 
So thinking about meaning is also important when you're using color. Some colors already have meaning in American culture, but colors also have different meanings in different cultures too. So it's important to keep these meanings in mind. In US culture, when associated with numbers, red generally implies negative and green generally implies positive. So in the example on this slide, I'm showing that Gen 2 penguins increased from 2007 to 2009, but I used red. Um, and then on the right-hand graph, I used green. So if my data is showing an increase, I should probably use green instead of red to highlight the values because using green builds on our audience's pre-existing association of the color green with positive numbers, which makes it easier for the audience to understand the message of the graph. Using red for an increase increases their cognitive load because it goes against their pre-existing association of the color red with negative numbers, which makes it slightly harder for the graph to be read and understood. Um, color can also evoke emotions. So one thing you can think about when creating a visualization is what tone your visualization should have and then pick colors to match that tone. For example, red colors often feel warmer, blue colors often feel cooler. Colors on the red side of the color spectrum also tend to appear larger and closer, while colors on the blue side of the color spectrum tend to appear smaller and further away. So that's another thing to think about with colored meanings. Colors can have a lot of meanings. Um, and sometimes you might not have to think about, might not have to think about it very much aside from kind of those common associations. Or sometimes you may really want to think about them in a way to convey tone and message and emotion. Another meaning to keep in mind is that we associate darker with greater or more important. So when highlighting information, it works best to use a darker color for the most important piece and a lighter color for the other pieces. This is completely made up data, um, but notice where your eyes focus in each of these graphs. So if my message here is that 20% of this made up data people um, love pie charts, and I highlight the 80% section of the chart in a dark color and just put the 20% in the light background color, our eye actually gets drawn to the teal dark section, which is not where I want my message to be, which is not my message. My message is an 80% 80 80 hate pie charts. Um, so if I use the graph on the right instead, where the 20% wedge has been highlighted in the darker teal color, that's where my audience's eye is going to be drawn. That's my main message. That helps them connect the information to the message. I've seen a lot of uh, pie charts and donut charts recently using the version on the left. Um, and that, I mean, I, there's probably design reasons for that, but I think the version on the right is a little bit more um, effective because it draws the audience's attention to the slice of the pie or that I want my audience to focus on. And another thing with meaning um, with this darker implying more, it also applies to sequential and diverging gradients. So you always want to use the darkest color for the largest value and the lightest color for the smallest value. So in the chart on the left, I've got a map of the lower um, 48 US states. Um, and I'm, again, this is, they're not real numbers, but I, my color scale goes from a dark color for a low value and a light color for a high value versus my graph on the right which is using a light color for a low value and a dark color for a high value. And the graph on the right, where I'm using a lighter color for a low value, um, that is more intuitive um, and goes along with our pre-existing ideas around light color, low value, dark color, high value. And another important factor to consider always when using color and visualization is accessibility and different types of color blindness. So, we probably have heard of red green color blindness, and that means that a person cannot distinguish between certain shades of red and certain shades of green. So then it's important to avoid using those colors together without providing other visual cues like up or down arrows or plus or minus signs. Um, if you want to use red and green to highlight negative and positive change, you could just highlight the negative change with red and leave positive values in a default color other than green. And there are several online checkers that you can use to run your color palettes or even your visualizations through to check if they are accessible for different variations of color blindness. And um, another thing that you can use is if you put your visualizations in grayscale, you can see if they're still differentiable. And then I have two resources I'm gonna paste into the chat here. Um, I might have to paste them one by one to get them to go through nicely. So there is one. And there is the second. Um, so the Adobe color site um, is has a, two different, con there's one that's a contrast checker and one that will check your palette 
um, colors. So the contrast checker is going to see if your text and your background are distinguishable. And then the other tool allows you to put in, um, you know, a categorical color palette or um, of like, I think six different colors and see what it looks like under different types of color blindness to make sure that the colors are still differentiable. Then the second website um, is a, another um, way to check a categorical palette against um, different types of color blindness to make sure that it is accessible. And to test your final visualizations for effective use of color, one thing that I like to do is looking away um, or closing my eyes and then looking back at the visualization or just putting it aside for a little bit and then coming back to it and seeing what I notice where my eyes go first. You can also ask a colleague to do this and that helps to determine if the color use is drawing attention um, to the area you intended or if it's distracting or focusing their attention elsewhere. This is always also really helpful for any of these principles and all the, the um, and kind of any visualization project, if you are able to ask a friend, um, a colleague, uh, anyone, like just someone around you, whether they're familiar with the um, information that you're presenting and with graphs or not, just show them a visualization you're working on and ask them to tell you what message they find from it, what like what stands out to them, where are their eyes drawn first. Those kinds of things will really help you understand um, what's sticking out and what is what what what, the, what message people are taking away from it, and then you can see if that aligns with what you were intending. All right, so thinking again about visualization and what is good data viz and what uh, why does it matter? Um, again, this testing that I just mentioned is really helpful to see how effective your your visualizations are. And um, I like this message from Alberto Cairo, and he says, rules of data visualization matter as much as the results of the tests you may conduct with your readers. So again, despite all these guidelines and principles I've just talked about and some others that you might have heard of, it's really important to test out a data visualization with your audience, with colleagues, with friends, to see how they interpret it and if they get the intended um, message. And if you don't have someone around that you can ask, again, something I like to do is I... Um, put it aside for a little bit and then come back to it and really try and pay attention to like where I focus. Um, that's another thing that you can check. So testing is really helpful. And I see we have about 15 minutes left and I wanna make sure I leave time for questions. So I'll probably skip um, my examples of putting this all together, but I did want to get to um, what we've done today and um, a key and, and one more little poll about what your key takeaway is. Um, so we have this last link. Um, Valerie, if you could put the second link in again, that would be really helpful. Um, and I need to switch over to my sharing of that. But we discussed questions of what good data viz is, why it matters, and I explained the three sets of different design principles that are gonna help you make more effective and engaging data visits. And I wanna make sure we have time for questions. I definitely love to share the examples if we have time, but I also know I've seen like five questions come in to the Q&A and I know I also saw one in the chat. And so I wanna make sure that we have enough time for that. So um, I'll share some ways that you can get in touch with me where I, and some other places that I have share information where I do have some examples um, of how this all works. So let me just, well, I will stop sharing now. And if you want, while we're, let me just, I need to switch the poll to the right thing. So you don't see the previous question, you see the new question. Okay, so now on that poll, there's a question of what is a key takeaway? If you wanna put some ideas in there and we can get to questions. Great, thank you so much. That was a really informative workshop and I think everyone really enjoyed it. Um, just one small question to start out. Um, you recommended a book, I think, Femin Data Science Feminism or something, what oh, was that yeah. title again? It was data feminism. I can put a link to it in the chat oh, be because you can actually access it online, I think. Okay, so this is the link to the main page. I think that there's a link from this website onto um, into where you can access it online. I mean, you can purchase a copy too, but they do have an open access version as well. Perfect. Uh, okay, so Amanda asks how you can basically um, move from exploratory visualizations to explanatory and how you decide what to include because there's an impulse you know with a research background you want to include everything but how do you choose what to include yeah this is a really good question and something that i was actually dealing with um some this week so um 
it's it's challenging. I think deciding what to include, for me, I start thinking about what I think about my audience. So what do they need to know? And what is most important for them to see? And that's one way I try and kind of cut it out. Also, if I'm able to, um, like the example that I'm thinking about right now is a project that I'm working on where I'm doing some analysis for a working group. And I was able to talk to the primary person that I'm like the individual in that working group who I'm working with primarily. And by talking with her and showing her some of the stuff that I'd done, then I was able to get a better idea of what, um, what I should keep and what I should exclude and what she was really looking for. So I think that again, like that audience idea, if you don't have access to an audience member like that, just trying to imagine what the audience member would like. Um, I also, um, I'll, one of the links I'm going to share is to my website, which has, which is resources. And there's a free training that you can access there, which talks about using the design process for data viz. And I think that helps with like thinking through how can you you start with your audience and then kind of going through prototyping and iterating and like kind of get, getting down to what to include. Um, so I guess my primary thing would be audience. And then the second thing I think would be like, what message do you want them to get? And what information should you keep to convey that message most clearly? That makes a lot of sense. Focusing on the message sometimes can be harder when there's other cool stuff going on, but yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so someone asked, uh, they basically have read about how having two visuals on a page, sometimes, you know, your audience will start with the leftmost one. So is there a pretentive attribute for location in that way? Um, I don't know that that's a pretentive attribute, but yes, certainly if you're, if you're making visualizations for people who um, have like grown up or got, read in languages where they move from left to right and top to bottom, your top left corner of a dashboard or visualization is going to be like kind of the primary place that people go first. So that's why you generally put your title in your top left. Um, or if you're building a dashboard, you want the most important information in the top left. So yes, I'm not sure if that ties into any of these design principles, but I, I that's certainly true. And someone else is asking, what's a good rule of thumb to avoid overcrowding in a visualization, especially when you have high dimensional data that you're trying to show? Yeah, so this is, it's tricky, right? When you're trying to um, show a lot of information or complex information. Here, what I like to do, um, if I'm presenting it to people, which is not always the case, but if it, I'm building out some sort of presentation, then I like to sometimes build the visualization piece by piece through the slides, like start with the axes to orient people, then add some of the data points, then add more of the data points. And so if, you, if you're able to do it that way, that's one way to do it. Um, if you have got a, if, you're, if that's not the way that you are um, <laughs> able to present the information, then I think trying to provide context and orientation is helpful to the audience so they can get an idea of like what they're looking at before they see it. And then maybe trying to also highlight key messages and key takeaways um, and using maybe some of the pre-attentive attributes to kind of highlight key pieces of information. I hope that's helpful to the person. Great, yeah, no, that sounds really useful, especially like building up visualization so you don't have to have all the complexity at once. Um, Someone else is asking if you have really unbalanced data, so you have some data points like close to zero, some like in the thousands, um, what's a good approach to visualize kind of like really unbalanced or biased data? Yeah, so um, one way to do that is changing your scale. So you can use like a log scale or something like that. Um, that can be confusing to people. Um, I I have a background in math, like I have, a degree, I have two degrees in math and I like still can't wrap my head around log scales sometimes. <laughs> so, um, but that's one way to do it. If, you're, if that's appropriate for your audience or you can provide the appropriate explanation and context so that they can um, understand that. Um, another way might be to present all the information and then zoom in on a section. So mm -hmm. um, the same project that I just mentioned, I've got, um, I'm visualizing some salary data and most people have salaries below a certain amount, but there are a few people who have salaries really high. And so my first visuals, I'm showing everything and then I'm showing the same visual again, but filtered down to people below a certain threshold, because mm. I think it's important for people to get the whole picture. But then I also want, you can't see the nuance of the data and you can't as easily distinguish between the different salaries of different categories 
when it's when you're seeing everything but when i filter it down to below this threshold where most people are then you can start to see the differences so that might be another option is show the whole picture and then show a view that's filtered down to the most important area of the mm. range that's great yeah so you don't lose any of that data but you're still able to show what you want to focus on mm -hmm. um someone else was asking if you considered the use of color brewery i'm not sure what that is oh but i don't know I think that's in relation to Color Brewer. I can okay. pop a link into the chat real fast. Yes, I use Color Brewer. It's a way to, um, it's a it's a great resource for color palettes. So I didn't really talk about how to, um, here's a link to it. I think this is probably what this person is asking about. Um, I, uh, I didn't really talk about how to pick color palettes at all, which is definitely a, a challenging thing. I'm probably a way more <laughs> extensive topic than I can cover um, in four minutes, but. Um, <laughs> Color Brewer is a great resource for finding color palettes. And I like that it gives you categorical palettes. It gives you, which means that like those like different colors for different categories, like distinct colors. It also gives you um, quality, uh, what am I? Quantitative, that's the word I was looking for. Um, like numeric ranges for palettes, like mm. a low, a light color to a dark color. Um, it's a great tool. And I know at least in R it's integrated into R. And so you can easily change scales in um, color scales in R to use that. Um, so I definitely, I definitely recommend that as a place to find color palettes. Oh, great. Uh, that's awesome. Okay. So I'm seeing one more question in the chat and I've seen a lot of requests where people want to see the examples that you mentioned. So maybe <laughs> we could talk about this question yeah. and if you quickly go through some examples. So yeah. um, someone asked, um, I think that they're creating visualizations for an audience, like both a high level audience and a mid-level audience. And they've gotten requests um, to have basically fewer visualization pages. So it may be like fewer visualizations, but options to click for more information on some visualizations. And they're wondering what your thought is on that kind of implementation. I think that's a great way to implement that. Um, another thing that you could think about is like, um, it, it depends if you're presenting it in slides or in a report, but maybe like an executive summary, um, or if it's slides like a, a few slides that show the high level information and then you kind of have your backing slides that people can access um, or in a report like you have your high level and um, kind of few pages and then later in the report you have the details. I think those are all great ways to do that. I definitely, this is something I struggle with too of like how to figure out, um, you know, exactly what information to present to what audience. Um, but I think it's great that you're thinking about like what the audience needs and then kind of filtering out the information for them. I think that's a great, great way to present it that way. Great. So I can, yeah, I can do one of the examples. Let me just get myself situated again. Thanks people for your key takeaways. Um, let me just get back up to one of them. Okay, I'll try, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to present them both. I also just don't wanna run out of time. Um, while I'm doing that, I think I shared the right screen there. I am just gonna pop as well really quick. Um, I'm, I know I didn't send this to all of you, um, Julia and Valerie ahead of time. So I'm just gonna pop into the chat really quick. Um, there's a whole bunch of links for how you can get in touch with me. Um, and if, if you have any other questions or things like that, I'll, I'm happy to answer those there. Um, okay, so let me get to these examples. Um, so first one is a bar chart from a LinkedIn article. This um, shows the percentage of LinkedIn jobs for entry-level jobs that ask for three or more years of experience and the data is shown by industry. And this one I think is pretty good, but I think there's some ways to make it better. Um, a few things to notice here. So I'm trying to think, I'm trying to like read through my notes and try and do this quicker than <laughs> as quickly as I can to try and meet the time um, while still giving you good information. So one thing to notice is that the percent labels have a decimal point, which I don't think is completely necessary for the audience because I think the audience could probably be told that 60% of jobs in a category require at least three years of experience. I don't think they need to know 60.3%. 60 60 um, the orange bars showing the percentages are also overlaid on these gray bars, which total to 100%. And that might help the audience understand the data better, but it, I think it does add an extra layer um, of processing because the audience has to figure out what those gray bars mean. And then also the industry labels are pretty far from the bars. And so it makes it a little challenging to compare between industries because you have to kind of read pretty far across to get the information. 
So using proximity, um, I moved the labels for the industries to the left of the bar and the labels for the bar length to the right. And I removed the decimal points as well. And so moving the percentages to the end of the bar helps the audience understand that the length of each bar represents the percent, percent excuse me, and it allows me to put the industry labels right at the start. Um, and this is making use of the default principle of proximity because the audience will associate the label and the bar and the and the industry label, the bar and the percent label together because they're all in a row together. Um, then we didn't really talk about this too much, but adding um, headlines and titles are really, um, are a good way to um, add context and help people to get away the takeaway, main takeaway. So I just updated the title here to explain two of the key takeaways about um, the industries that require, the industries that have the most jobs with more than three levels of experience. And I added a subtitle to explain the timeline and the caption with the data source. So it's always really important to cite where we get data from and the headlines can help people with a key takeaway. Previously, it just said um, the entry level jobs mirage. So that's what I did there. And then I'm using color and similarity to highlight the th bars related to the industries that I'm referencing in the title. So by highlighting these bars in purple and the rest in gray, I'm helping people create an association between the two different groups. Um, and they'll look at the bar purple bars first because those are related to the title. Well, not because they're related to title, because they're purple, but I want them to look at the first because they're related to the title. And those are the industries where more than 40% of the entry level job postings are requiring at least three years of experience. And I know we're at time. Julia, I'm happy to go a little bit over if that's okay and talk through the second example, or do you want to stop here? Um, I think we can do a couple more minutes. I think okay. people are pretty interested. Okay, um, and then but... if people have to drop off we can always use, um, we can always get catch the video. So I'll go through the second <laughs> example too. Okay, so then this example comes from a table from a website, Privacy Affairs, and it shows the average price on the dark web for different types of scanned documents between two different years. And in this format, we can see which type of documents have a decrease in price and which type of documents have an increase in price um, between the two years. And the table is sorted from lowest um, to highest in terms of the year over year difference, which helps us see which prices have increased the most. But it's a little challenging to um, understand the values themselves and compare the prices of each type of document in the table. Um, and we are, we are seeing that use of red and green together, but we have it accompanied by minus and plus signs. So that is that kind of secondary encoding that if someone's not able to distinguish between the red and green colors, they will see the plus and minus signs and be able to distinguish that way. So in this case, I'm actually going to turn it into a completely different visualization. Um, and I'm going to use a slope graph instead of a table. Um, and I really like slope graphs. So it's, it's kind of a lot of information right now. We're going to clean it up. So first, I'm making a different type of visualization. And I'm using a slope graph. And I like slope graphs because they show um, the value in one year and the value in the other year. So we can compare between 2021, or we, compare, we can compare across 2021 and across 2022 the different uh, prices for these different items. But we can also see how much things have changed in terms of the connection between. So the pre-attentive attribute of orientation is going to help the audience immediately notice the two steepest lines here. I'm using similarity and proximity to associate the line labels with the lines themselves because I'm putting the lines, the labels at the end of the line and I'm using the same color. But there's a lot of colors going on here and we can make a couple adjustments to try and focus attention a little bit more. So I'm adding a, high, a headline that says scans of driver's licenses from Minnesota, Alberta, and Australia have had the largest increase in price on the dark web. And then I use the pre-attentive attribute of hue to highlight the two lines representing those three documents and draw focus away from the other five lines by making them gray. And I decided to only use two colors because the audience is going to group those into two groups. Um, and they'll see one group of the purple lines and one group of the gray lines. And the Gestalt principle of connection is still going to distinguish between each of the line or make it so the audience can distinguish between all of the different lines because the Gestalt principle of connection helps the audience group the two data points for each document together since they're connected by a line. So this means the audience can follow each individual line even though they're the same color. 
And one thing to note here is these purple lines are actually behind the gray lines. Um, it might be a little hard to see, but do because of the Dassault principle of closure, we're still going to see the purple line as one whole um, connection, continuous line, but I'd rather have them on top because they're the lines that I want to focus on. So I just moved the purple lines on top of the gray ones so that they have an unbroken connection. And then by their position on top of the lines, they appear most important. And again, because of closure, the gray lines are gonna be viewed as solid and connected, even though um, most of them are broken up by the purple lines. So um, those are my two examples. I know I went through them pretty quickly, um, but as I said, on the, the links that I shared, um, to my kind of my social media channels and my website and things like that, I have a lot more, um, a lot more examples like this. So um, thanks, thanks for letting me go over a little bit. I hope that wasn't too speedy a, a, <laughs> a review of the examples, and I really appreciate um, you all being here. So thank you.